All right, so we did have a whole bunch of people not here yesterday, so I'm going to kind of, like I said, start from the beginning, but we're not playing Guess Who today. But I know we did it yesterday. It was really good. We did play, uh, we didn't play Who, we played Guess Who yesterday. So when we played Guess Who, what did we use to figure out that I had Bill? Observation. We used some observation. We used properties of these people, their hair color, their eye color, whether we're wearing glasses or a hat, uh, all that good stuff. And that related to minerals because identifying a mineral using your mineral identification chart on your reference table is the same concept. We are going to use properties of minerals to determine which mineral we have left. And those properties we're gonna focus in, which by the way, if you weren't here, this is the first thing in your notes on page two. So on page two of your packet, if you weren't here, you need to grab one. Uh, the properties of a mineral that we care about are going to be luster, hardness, breakage, color, and streak. These, instead of saying, does your character have red hair or blonde hair, we're going to ask, does your what kind of luster does your mineral have? What's its hardness? What's kind of breakage? And all of that stuff. And that will identify us as, or give us the exact name of the mineral, just like we figured out yesterday that I had Bill. This, by the way, is exactly the same thing you guys did last year with uh, using bird beaks and what they ate to identify the name of the bird or which bird group it went into. Really, we're doing dichotomous keys again. Uh, we are using them. It looks different. This is a dichotomous key. It looks different than the one you used. When you guys did guess who as little kids, you were still using a dichotomous key. You just didn't know it. It was getting you ready to actually use a real concept. So, uh, a lot, just like in Battleship, if you ever played Battleship, it was really getting you ready for graphing and latitude and longitude stuff. So sometimes games are actually good things. In fact, we're going to refer back to Minecraft a whole bunch this chapter. Yep, Minecraft has its little... They, they never did, no. And I still don't understand Minecraft, so I need people to help me out with that one. But anyway... Yesterday, we did get started a little bit. We talked about how just like genetics and how your DNA is put together um, kind of determines what you look like in your properties. The same is true with minerals. But instead of DNA, we're going to have atoms. So the way that atoms are put together, which is on the back on page two, yep. Yeah. The way atoms are put together on the inside of a mineral will determine the properties of a mineral. So how hard it is or what kind of luster is all determined by how the mineral is put together, how the atoms are put together inside of the minerals. The key here is you get this last bullet. So if you did not copy this all down yesterday, please make sure you at least have this last bullet that says uh, the internal arrangement of atoms. So the properties of a mineral are determined by the internal arrangement of atoms. Again, just how the atoms are arranged inside the mineral. Okay, that was a catch up from yesterday. Then we, so if you didn't get that, you'll have to grab that from someone else or from teams. We started with luster yesterday. I didn't like how we went about it yesterday, so I've changed it up a little bit today. So luster is described as how the mineral reflects light. But we don't want to just talk about that as being shiny or dull. In earth science, the two types of luster are metallic and non-metallic. So this is where we left off yesterday. Metallic simply means looks like a metal. It does not mean it's shiny. It means it looks like metal. Not all metal is shiny. Non-metal just simply means it does not look like metal. So metal things don't have to be shiny and non-metal things can be shiny. So I want you not to think about the word shiny or anything that means shiny. We simply are asking ourselves when you have a mineral in front of you, 
does it look like metal or does it not look like metal? Now, there are groups of minerals around the room. So it looks like Liza's got a bunch. London has a bunch and Lily has a bunch. So what I'm going to have you do is um, Olivia and Trey over, go gather around Liza. Um, this, these two rows gather around London and the remaining two rows gather around Lily. You have a pile of minerals there. I would like you to put those minerals into two groups, metallic and non-metallic. So take a few minutes and do that right now. All right, so in those categories, walking around, I saw the same mistakes I expected to see on the part of these. Mm, take them all. Uh, so these were all the rocks, and most of you did great with those three. What category are those? Those are non-metallic. They do not look like metal. Some people in my other classes wanted to put this one into the metal category. Why might they have wanted to? Because it's, it's shiny. It's a bad word. So again, don't get stuck on the shininess. There is no metal out there that looks like this. This looks like a glass or plastic. It is, a lot of you already know, this is rose quartz. So that is that one. Same deal with this guy. This is not metal. Again, it is shiny but it looks more like brown glass. So if you um, have ever picked up a brown beer bottle somewhere, it might look a lot like this one. Not to drink, by the way, you were picking it up to um, clean up things, I hope. Yeah. So that is non-metallic. A lot of people had these obviously in the right categories. These are, sorry, these two, the one that looks like gold. By the way, did we talk about that yesterday? Is gold a metal? Yeah, yeah gold is a metal. A lot of people will get stuck on gold is only, or I'm sorry, metals are only like silvery. Metals can be gold colored. We talked about, is this class we talked about Olympic medals? Yeah, so Olympic medals are called that because they're made of metal. So silver, bronze, gold, uh, there isn't a platinum, but platinum is also a metal. Um, this one, again, this flat black one, again, not shiny, but it is a metal. So it does get put into that category. Not all metal is shiny. Uh, nobody messed that one up. This is the one I do want to talk about that earthy red, the one it kind of looks like a lot of people want to tell me it looks like a brick. I already talked to one group about this, but then decided to talk about it as a whole group. So on our reference table, so hopefully you've already seen that the first way that minerals get separated is by their luster. The metallic groups at the top the non-metallic group is the whole bottom section. But there is this one mineral called hematite that can be either metallic or non-metallic. That means it sometimes looks metallic, sometimes doesn't. And it all depends on really the conditions that are around it. Here is that mineral when it's metallic. You can see it is, yes, it is very shiny and sparkly, but it does look like a metal. Here's that mineral when it's non-metallic. If you notice, it's really a rusty version of, uh, of the same rock. So rust happens on metals. So that's why this one is still considered metallic. Um, one way when you are handed rock, uh, minerals and told to identify it, one thing you should always do is check out this one as well. This one is super easy to identify by, by color. It's either metallic silver, that's that one, no doubt, or earthy red. So it kind of just looks like a brick red color. So again, that rust color. So that one is always fair game, um, no matter what your mineral looks like, if it's metallic or non-metallic, it could always be hematite. So check the color to remove that one to see if it's uh, hematite. But either it means it could be and it's like not both. Right. It's it, right. It's not going to be both at the same time. 
This one, all of you who had this in the non-metal category were correct. In this version, this is non-metal. This one, metal. Uh, that's a very good question. So thank you for that. All right, uh, moving on. So hardness, we didn't start here at all, right? Okay, hardness, let's go back to the PowerPoint. Yes, yeah, so from lab, some of you know that hardness is not, wow, this desk is hard, wow, my shirt is soft. Hardness is really a measure of how easily a mineral can be scratched. So that goes in the first box for define hardness. It's a super good. Hardness is a measure of how easily a mineral can be scratched. From lab, do you guys remember the hardest known mineral? Diamonds. Diamonds are the hardest known mineral. They have a hardness of what we say is 10. So in theory, a diamond should be able to scratch anything that's weaker than it. So to decide how hard something is, so this goes in, um, explain how to find the hardness of a mineral. We, do, we figure out the hardness of a mineral by if a mineral can scratch an object, then that mineral is harder than the object. If not, it's softer. Is there a scale? Yes, it's, it's the next slide. It's called Mohs Scale of Hardness, M-O-H-N. Mohs Scale of Hardness. So you're not just scratching it on any old object, you're, scra you're using objects with known identifiable hardnesses to give an actual numeric value. So let me show you on the next slide once everybody's done writing. You have a most? I do not, I can put one together for the most part, but I don't have a specialized, yeah. I'll show you in a second. M-O-H-N. Again, it's on the next scale or slide. Okay, so here's most scale of, oh, there it is. Oh, there is no N. I don't know why I was thinking there was an N, M-O-H. Um, so most scale of hardness takes um, 10 known minerals and scientists have identified and narrowed down their exact hardnesses. So if you ever have a piece of talc, you automatically know it has a hardness of one. Uh, we're not going to have this whole scale, though. So what, how I said I could put one together is I could get a piece of talc, a piece of gypsum, a piece of calcite. Probably not gathering a piece of diamond for school purposes, but you could because not all diamonds are expensive. Like a diamond saw um, or a diamond bit drill bit, uh, those aren't like expensive diamonds. They're not like ones you would put in a ring or anything. But anyway, I could technically put one together. We use common other objects, such as your fingernail, a penny, a iron nail, a piece of glass. We don't, I don't have a steel file uh, or what's called a streak plate. These again are objects that we know the hardnesses of these, and we're going to use them to figure out the hardness of different objects. So let's go through how this would work. So I'm going to stop. Whoa. I want to stop sharing and we're going to put a mineral out here. We're going to determine its hardness using some very common. Where did it go? There. Sorry. There you go. This is what I want. We're going to determine the hardness using those common objects. So we have this mineral number four here. The first thing I'm going to do is grab a piece of glass that after I drop it and probably break it. Speaking of, when you have glass, it is easy to break. There might be a broken piece on the edge. Um, it might get chipped off. It might have gotten shattered. So one thing I would ask of you is please don't grasp the glass like this. 
So doing exactly what I'm doing is probably not allowed because you could have a sharp piece on the edge and you now could potentially cut yourself or get some glass on you. The other thing is we're going to use this mineral to scratch the glass. If you're pushing too hard, you could accidentally shatter the glass. Again, I don't want that in your hand. Glass in your hand, blood equals paperwork. I don't want to do it. So whenever you're testing the hardness, go ahead and put the glass plate down on the desk and you're going to go ahead and use some force. And you will see, so there were some scratches on this already, but I don't know if you guys can see from where you are. It does not add any scratches to this glass. So by the way, what's harder, the glass or the mineral? What? The glass is harder. Now from that PowerPoint slide, does anybody remember the hardness of glass? 5.5. You do not need to memorize that, by the way. It will always be provided. So since glass has a hardness of 5.5, what can I say about the hardness of this mineral? Less than 5.5, which really helps because there's the hardness on the reference table. Hopefully you realize this one was non-metallic. We can say it is not any of these minerals. So I know for sure it's not potassium feldspar, plagioclase feldspar, olivine, quartz, or garnet because they're too hard. So if this was the guess who game, I would be knocking down these four minerals because they're not, they're not mine. Mine is too soft to be any of these guys down here. Then we're gonna go to the next object, which was a steel nail. Now, can I, is there any way I can scratch? Like, can I try to do this and see if it's scratching? We're gonna use the nail to see if it scratches this. Nail, by the way, was 4.5. It scratches, what's harder, the nail or the mineral? The nail is harder, so if this is 4.5, what can I say about this? It's less than 4.5, so I can even eliminate some more. Before this was an option, and this was an option, they're no longer options. If this was guess who, I'm knocking them down. Now I'm gonna move on to a penny. A penny has a hardness between three and 3.5. What's harder? Penny is harder than the mineral. So now I know this is less than three or 3.5. Again, can I eliminate some? Well, now I can eliminate fluorite because that has a hardness of four. Next thing is my very own fingernail. Again, we're not, I'm not trying to scratch this way. I am not in the market of ruining your fingernails. What you will do is take your fingernail and see if you can scratch that. And I definitely did. Fingernails have a hardness of 2.5. So this is less than, by the way, we're going to stick with less than or equal to 2.5. So now we still have a whole bunch but we have definitely narrowed this down quite a bit to what this mineral could be. So that's how you use hardness and the reference table together. We definitely have some time to keep going. After hardness, we're going to look at what I define as breakage, how it breaks. There are two types of breakage and those are cleavage and fracture. Cleavage, really means does the mineral cleave? That's what it means. It's not the cleavage that you might originally be thinking. It means can the object cleave? And when something cleaves, it breaks apart into two nice broken pieces or breaks into these um, separate surfaces with flat, smooth surfaces. So cleavage, definition of cleavage is tendency of a mineral to split or separate along flat surfaces. So anytime you pick up a mineral and you see flat breaks, that's going to be considered cleavage versus the opposite of cleavage, the only other way it's going to break is called fracture. 
this is when the mineral basically breaks all randomly. I like to picture if you took a stick and you fractured it, it's going to be broken into a bunch of little pieces, all random. That's a fracture. So I like to think of it as lumpy, bumpy, or rough. Yes, I think ice cubes would break all randomly. Not, I'm trying to... So they be a bunch yeah, of, they want yes, they want to be a bunch of little pieces. The only thing I caution you for is when you're figuring out, is it fracture or cleavage? It's not about how it feels. So even though I put rough, lumpy, bumpy, or rough, I'm not talking about how it feels. I want you looking at the individual breaks, and I'll pass this around, but cars... Yeah, Carson, what do you think there? What do you see where it's broken? How did it break? What? It's broken. So even though when you touch it, it feels bumpy, right? So if you look at each place it's broken, they break straight down and straight over. They have very perfectly straight breaks. So again, don't touch it, but look at how it breaks. In fact, I have a broken piece of it right here. Um, and I can show you. So stop my share. This broken piece is broken in a perfectly straight piece. It broke straight up and down. Uh, that is that some perfect cleavage or really nice cleavage. Don't make this weird, people. All right. After whether it has cleavage or fracture, actually, let me show you on the reference table. On the reference table, they identify whether it has cleavage or fracture by the check mark. <coughs> so if the check mark is to the left of the line, it's in the cleavage column. If it's to the right, it has fracture. So this is the one we were looking at before when I was testing hardness. What do you think, cleavage or fracture? Cleavage, you can't get much straighter than that. But let me also point out, see how it's all rough and bumpy and lumpy on this side? This side does not have cleavage, but the mineral is determined to have cleavage if it's anywhere on it. So this only cleaves in one direction. This way, it does not cleave in on this side. But if there's any straight flat pieces, that's cleavage, which will help us if you remember, we had gotten all the way up to those were our choices before. This helps us a little bit because now I know for sure it's not this one. That one would have been sulfur that had cle uh, fracture. This one has cleavage. So let's keep going. After cleavage and fracture, the next thing you're going to look at is color. So in that first box for color on page three, we're going with most easily observed mineral property but the least useful. One. Yes, so that was gonna be my next question is why is it least useful? So uh, London just gave us one example. What did you say out loud again, London? They're both black, but it doesn't get any. Lots of minerals can have the same color. So in front of uh, London, she sees multiple black, blackish gray minerals. Uh, pyrite is actually kind of useful for color. What color is pyrite? That's school's gold. So that one is the only one that's kind of useful. Um, but for many of them, they are black, silver, gray. White is another classic example. Um, in lab, we're going to do 10 minerals in lab. Three of them are the exact same color. Uh, so color isn't super useful because many colors or many minerals can be the same color or vice versa. Up here, I have three pictures of quartz, rose quartz, smoky quartz, and amethyst. They're all quartz. Quartz can come in just about any color of the rainbow. So color's not super helpful for two reasons. Many minerals are the same color, and many minerals come in multiple colors. So some are useful, some are not. Again, let's take a look at the reference table. Um, when it says white to green, it means it can be whitish. 
on the way to the green spectrum. So you know how you go to look at paint colors and they come in, there's a gazillion shades of white and some of them have a greenish tint to it. That's what we got going on there. What does colorless mean to you? Means it's a clearish color. So clear, colorless to white. So it could be, some of you might call it white. Some of you might call it clear. What about the word variable? Could be any color. So this one could be literally colorless or variable, which means it could be clear or any color under the rainbow. So color is not super helpful for that. Uh, Carson mentioned pyrite. That one, it is useful. The only color pyrite comes in is that brassy yellow goldish color. So some of them are easy. Sulfur, yellow to amber, that's going to again be that yellowish color. So color super not helpful. In this case, where we were looking at this mineral, we had eliminated up to, could be any of these. Now I can get rid of this one. It's not black to dark brown. Could be this one, colorless to white. Could be this one, colorless to yellow. Could be this one, because some this could be considered white. Could still be this one, or this one, or that one. So white, a color did not help us identify this mineral. The next thing then we have to look at is going to be its streak. Streak is the color of the mineral's powder. How are we going to powder a mineral? Got to look at the ends. We got to look at the powder form. There's a couple of ways. You could grab a hammer and make a powder. Please don't do that because then I'd have to buy more minerals. So we don't use a hammer. We use what's called a streak plate. So that's a streak plate up there. A streak plate is just a piece of white tile. And we'll just rub the mineral along the tile and that's the color of the powder. You, again, cannot assume this based on the color of the mineral. That's going to be the color of the powder. Up there, that's a perfect example. That uh, mineral is more of that gray-black color. What color is, is it streak? A reddish brown. So definitely always test this. This will help you figure out a few of them. So describe how to find a streak, uh, rub it on a piece, uh, on a streak plate. That's it. Sorry, add that. Rub it on a streak plate. So it says describe how to find the streak. Rub it on a streak plate. Or scratch it. That's another way. On a, no, that's the hardness word. Never mind. Then finally, a few minerals have some really special properties. They call these distinguishing characteristics on the reference table. And these four are the four that will go in those boxes there for special properties. One is the acid test. I'm going to show you this tomorrow. You can drop some acid on a mineral and it'll bubble. You could, in theory, taste a rock. Please don't put your tongue on any of my rocks. That's gross. But if you ask me, hey, Mrs. Ritz, would this one taste salty? I'll tell you yes or no. Because one of the rocks, halite, is nothing more than a fancy word for salt. Some of them are magnetic. Actually, only one. Magnetite is magnetic. And then some of them have what's called a greasy feel. There, why don't you grab your reference table and see it if you can search down the distinguishing characteristics column and find me a mineral that will bubble with acid. 
Calcite. Calcite is the one. Keep going. Is there any more? Dolomite. That one says if it's powdered, so if you rub it on a street plate and that powder bubbles with acid, are you guys going to need that back? Okay. Let me get that in a second. So here's a piece of calcite. Let me show you what I mean by bubbles with acid. I have up here very weak hydrochloric acid. It's basically a strong vinegar. It's not much stronger than vinegar that you would use um, at home. And I, if I put it on here, you guys, looks like hydrogen peroxide or when you put vinegar and baking soda together. I mean, we're not talking about some impressive uh, chemistry experiment up here, just a few bubbles. That's what I mean by bubbles with acid. There are some that are magnetic, but not all of your minerals are gonna be magnetic. So here's a magnet off my board. Here's the mineral that gets attracted to a magnet. So there's one that gets attracted. Not all of them are going to get attracted. Nothing with that. Again, that one does. Uh, when I say that they taste again, if you lick them, it would taste like um, salt. Don't taste them, please, though. And then some of them, and I'll give you this rock. I'll pass this one around if you want. Some of them will have a greasy feel. When you take this rock right here, kind of rub it on your hands, it almost feels slippery. To me, this reminds me of if I had just put lotion on my hands and then picked up a mineral. So it's not like, like it doesn't, it's not like overly greasy, but it does feel a little slippery. So I'll let you guys feel this to see what I mean by a greasy feel. Uh, so I'll put those notes back up, but once you have the dis the special properties, we are done for today. There are the dis special properties. Oh, sorry. Put it back. Wrong button. Yeah, I know. It was so loud. I was reading back and there's some.